they're about to lose, Americans are about to lose their First Amendment. And uh, this must not happen because the First Amendment is the gold standard of uh, freedom of speech or freedom in general uh, on this planet. So uh, it is my duty, I believe, uh, to warn Americans, to rally Americans, to uh, let them know that we in Europe are looking to our American brothers and sisters, and uh, we're hoping that one day America will restore uh, freedom of speech in the Western Judeo-Christian world. Now, my guest for the rest of the hour, um, some people have compared her to a, a female Forrest Gump. She was the daughter of an Austrian diplomat, or is the daughter of an Austrian diplomat, but she grew up learning English in America, so she spent some of her, her, her middle school years in, in the States, so she speaks perfect English. But she also lived in, and get this, Iran before and during the revolution, Iraq, Kuwait, when Saddam Hussein's army invaded, and in fact, she was one of the hostages and got out in one of those convoys. She was in Libya during 9-11, and she's been back in Austria uh, in the during the 2000s. Well, growing up as a female in the Middle East, living you know, side by side with Sharia, of course, she had diplomatic, some diplomatic protection. But as a as a diplomatic kid, you know, you you still go to all kinds of different schools and you're exposed to the local culture. And she didn't like what she saw in terms of being a woman in a in a Sharia country. When she came back to Austria, she she was horrified to see that their her country was already bending towards Sharia. And she began in the in the mid 2000s giving private seminars uh, to people on the dangers of that of what she saw as you know, creeping Islamization in her country and in Europe. At one of these private seminars, you know, these weren't public on the street. This this is like a house party seminar. Somebody uh, claimed or wrote down that she had said something about Muhammad, namely that he was a pedophile because Muhammad had slept with his favorite wife of many of his many wives, Aisha. Whom, whom he had married when he was in his 50s and she was six, and then quote unquote consummated the marri marriage at nine. She was brought up on on hate speech uh, laws in in Austria, you know, spent you know years in and out of court over this, and was convicted. And the def you know the, the conviction was based on the fact that Muhammad didn't only sleep with Aisha when she was nine, but continued to sleep with her until she was a teenager. Therefore. He couldn't be a pedophile. I mean, it, you, it can hardly make this stuff up. The point is, there is no free speech in Islam. And in Austria and in Europe, the, the, the concept of free speech that we have in America, it doesn't, really, it doesn't exist at all. And the, the European bureaucrats and politicians are more afraid already of their Muslim minorities than they are um, concerned about preserving freedom. So they're, they're more worried about inciting the anger of the Muslims than they are of, of their own people losing their freedom. So um, without further ado, I'd like to bring on uh, a woman named Elizabeth Sabadich wolf She has shared the dais with people like Diana West, Robert Spencer, Claire Lopez, uh, Stephen Coughlin, Alan West, the, all of these counter-jihad uh, you know, heavy hitters. Well, she is one of the counter-jihad heavy hitters herself. So Elizabeth, welcome aboard. Well, thank you so much, Matt. It's a, it's an honor to be with you, and you've named some of my very favorite people, and they are personal heroes of mine. Yeah, I haven't met them, but I've read I've read a lot of their books, and I and I I, I do um, check their websites. Um, you know, Gates of Vienna, Vlad Tepes blog, um, Pam Geller's website, Robert Spencer's Jihad Watch, all of them. They're very important, and it's notable that. Some of these people, uh, like Pam Geller and Robert Spencer, they're not even allowed to travel, for example, to Britain anymore. You can be a returning ISIS terrorist. You're welcome with open arms. But the counter-jihad heroes are not even allowed in Europe. How true, how true. And it's, it's really a sad, 
situation. Uh, it's very depressing and uh, it's frightening. And honestly, I don't even know if I'm allowed into the United Kingdom. I haven't tried and I'm not really sure if I want to. Uh, but uh, one of these days, I'll probably give it a try just to, yeah, just to give it a try and see what happens. Well, I have I um, have your book on Kindle, so I can't hold it up. But um, you have a, a book about your experience. There you go. You have a book about your experiences, <laughs> and it's called "The Truth Is No Defense." And can you? It was just published, wasn't it? It was published uh, a week and a half ago, and uh, it looks quite good uh, in in terms of sales. But of course, you know, I want as many people as as uh, possible to read about what can happen to you in just, you know, a few days. And uh, if you're not careful what you say, uh, and this means you have to self-censor here in, in Europe, which I do every single day, and I tell my daughter to self-censor when she's in school. Uh, but also in the United States, you have uh, something called prior restraint. Uh, which is certainly not compatible with uh, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Yeah, you know, if um, we we kind of dodged a bullet in the fact that Hillary Clinton was not elected president, because correct, um, she was as as Secretary of State, and I, I think it's number eight twenty two, but she was supporting a UN resolution, which was proposed by people had never heard of the you know the second biggest. Uh, a group of nations in the on the planet is something called the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, 57 nations. You know, that's what, remember Obama said, I've been to almost all 57 states. I think it was a Freudian slip because the OIC is the 57 Muslim nations. And they're like the, the, the 500 pound gorilla in the zoo because they have so much clout because those 57 countries are like a, a glow, a mailed fist you know, uh, going into a bowl of jello. And they've been promoting this concept of, of uh, blasphemy, anti-blasphemy laws, which would be formalizing the, the, what happened to you in Austria, that you do not have the freedom of speech because in, in uh, the Islamic concept of, of blasphemy and slander, the truth is no defense, as your book said. It's whatever angers Absolutely. Muslims, that's what slander. It's, it's that which a Muslim uh, will or might uh, dislike, no matter the content or uh, whether or not it's truth. So my book uh, called The Truth is No Defense is exactly what happened to me. It's the story of how European or Western nations uh, start using uh, Sharia laws without even knowing uh, that they are using them. They will never, of course, never uh, say or agree or uh, admit that this is the Islamic concept of slander that they applied uh, to my to my court, you know, in my court case. Uh, but this is exactly what happened. And just to remind you, uh, you were looking for the uh, UN resolution. It was called uh, Resolution 1618. And uh, right. if that had been implemented, uh, the First Amendment would have been torn to shreds, basically. Right. And the, the Muslims will say, well, we're not only trying to protect the um, protect Islam, we'll also make it illegal to, uh, you know, do things like make art with a Bible. But nobody in the Christian country has been asking for this. This is strictly a way for, for Islam to avoid any criticism of pri primarily the, it's, I can say it here in America, pedophile prophet. Um, when we come back after the break, we're going to continue this discussion. Stand by. Yeah, I'm back with um, Elizabeth Sabadich Wolf, who is um, one of my counter jihad heroines. She is literally on the front line of the counter jihad, living in uh, occupied Austria. I I, um, I noted that uh, recently there's even a statue of um, Jan Sobieski that was going to be gifted uh, and. Uh, Austria wouldn't take it. You know, the the the, the Sharia dimmy status seems to be uh, under well underway. And if um, if this UN resolution ever passes 1816, which makes blasphemy laws global and universal, don't be surprised if this passes because 
the tech giants that Alex was talking about in the video near the top of the hour, they'd be happy to support this. You know, the, the, the totalitarians of the left and the totalitarians of Islam, some people call it the red-green alliance, they're both happy to cooperate when it comes to crushing free speech because free speech in most of the world is the only pillar that they, of freedom that they really have. At least in, in the United States, uniquely probably in the world, we not only have the First Amendment, we have the Second Amendment. So if they tried to actually take away the First Amendment, uh, they, might, they might come up with a, against the Second Amendment in a very hard way. But that solution is not available in Europe. In, in Europe, uh, you see videos uh, coming out of Holland, for example, of native kids just being beaten by gangs of, of, uh, of uh, refugees, immigrants, what do you want to call them? And there's no recourse. All the native Europeans can do is stare out of a window, maybe make a recording on, on their smartphone. And if they post it to the internet, the police will come around and, and accuse them of inciting of violence or inciting hatred for posting a video of a crime that they saw. Well, Elizabeth Sabinich Wolf, she's not just a, a witness. She's actually, you know, a participant in this entire in this entire uh, 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 process of Islamization. So, um, Elizabeth, I'm sorry. Uh, go go ahead and and let's talk about where your case is now and and what's happening going forward with your case in Austria. Well, the, the case is over. The case is now completely over. There's no legal recourse for me. Once the European Court of Human Rights uh, decides and refuses uh, the final final appeal, uh, there's absolutely nothing I can do. It's now over and done with, and uh, we have to. All of us in Europe uh, have to accept that uh, the law system, the justice system, has succumbed to uh, Sharia to Sharia law, which is very sad. Uh, but there's nothing I can do anymore. It's it's over and done with. What I can do and what I what I've set my sights on uh, is to come to America as often as I can, as often as my uh, family permits me to do so, and to warn Americans about uh, they're about to lose. Americans are about to lose their First Amendment. And uh, this must not happen because the First Amendment is the gold standard of uh, freedom of speech or freedom in general uh, on this planet. So uh, it is my duty, I believe, uh, to warn Americans, to rally Americans, to uh, let them know that we in Europe are looking to our American brothers and sisters, and uh, we're hoping that one day America will restore uh, freedom of speech in the Western Judeo-Christian world. Uh, when you um, go on the internet, are you able to access websites like Jihad Watch and Gates of Vienna? Yes, yes um, I can. You, I, I have no problems at all. Do you think that you're monitored, or do you think you're on some kind yes. of a watch list now? Yes, yes, so, absolutely. So if I've you always made a been post, on a watch list. So you have to watch what you would post on social media. I don't uh, use social media at all. Okay, because even like sharing a cartoon or a meme or you know a, 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 an that. article that's no. too risky. No, no, won't do that. Because even if you're sharing it, then I guess it's seen legally that you are promulgating an idea, and that's yes. verboten. Been there, done that. No. Nope. Wow, but this is a shame because you know it was it was I think 14 years ago that the cartoon controversy erupted, and and we saw that uh, it was followed by what was called the days of rage in the Islamic world, which where where these cartoons were added to with other cartoons that were not part of the newspaper um, publishing of a few Muhammad cartoons. And this led to uh, uh, you know, people being killed, burned, you know, uh, riots, arson attacks where people were murdered. And I understand now that in, in Norway, there has been uh, uh, about two weeks ago, a Koran burning, which um, the police tried to prevent, even though there are there is no longer a blasphemy law in Norway, 
The police tried to prevent it, uh, also citing, you know, incitement to violence and things like that. So essentially, anything that makes Muslims angry enough to go berserk and turn violent, it's now considered that the people of, you know, for example, exercising their right to buy a book and do what they like with it, it's no longer permitted. And, and um, you know, nobody wants to see uh, violence, but I think it's an important lesson in the West that once you surrender your rights, uh, it's just a question of, of um, the next, it's, it's um, you know, hal only halal meat slaughter and uh, uh, hijabs and then burqas in, in um, you know, on passports and driver licenses and in public places. And step by step, Sharia is coming. I mean, in most European countries, the most popular and most common boy's name is now Mohammed. So looking forward uh, 15 or 20 years, I think most of these countries are going to have a hard time ever resisting Sharia. I mean, that's well, gloomy, we're not going but to, we're, we're not doing it now. It's not good. Since we're not resisting Sharia right now, uh, how are we going to resist it in 20 years when our population will have been decimated uh, dramatically? Uh, just to give you an example, I mean, I, I have one daughter. Uh, my next-door neighbors are refugees from Iraq. Uh, four daughters and a, a fifth, a boy, on his way. Now, this is... I mean, what else, what else, where else, what else should we discuss? I mean, it's, it's basically over, uh, given that the demographics are changing so rapidly. And, uh, you know, as long as we have fewer, uh, European babies, uh, native European babies and, and more non-European babies, no matter what we do, uh, we're going to lose, uh, be it in 20 years, be it in 30 years, it doesn't really matter. It's probably going to be in in my lifetime, and certainly in my in my daughter's lifetime, and uh, that is that is very frightening, especially because we could have stopped uh, this a few years ago, but now we've reached the point of no return, uh, so we can't stop it anymore. And if we do stop it, it's I'm afraid uh, going to be very violent, which is something that I do not want. But uh, what I've been fearful uh, of all along. When when we come back, um, I want to talk about a concept called hybrid vigor, which I'll leave that as a mystery for now. But Americans who look at Europe and say that's their problem, who cares? So they were chicken. They surrendered. They didn't resist. They didn't have a first and second amendment. They didn't fight back. Americans who look at Europe and say, it's not my problem, it doesn't concern me. You have to look at Europe as the giant canary in the coal mine. You know, Europe, Europe is just a decade or so ahead of America. That's the only difference. And when we come back, I'm going to talk about why an Islam, Islamicized Europe would be so dangerous to the rest of the world. You know, there, it, it, it wouldn't just be uh, like Islam that we understand in places like Morocco or Egypt. It would be an entirely new beast. And when we come back after the break, I want to discuss this concept of hybrid vigor and what it means to the entire world. You know, my, um, my last novel uh, that I finished about two years ago, it, um, it takes place between Ireland and Morocco, and it's a rescue novel. But the twist at the end is that everything that I describe in the novel actually happened in history. Every single event, all of the characters, they actually happened during the Barbary era, you know, in the 16 and 1700s. When Islam is weak, which it was most of this century, we tend to disregard it. But when Europe is weak and Islam is strong, they break out. And the difference this time is, it's not just pirates raiding on the high seas or making uh, uh, raids like into Ireland or France or Italy or even Iceland, which they did. Now, the, there's a, a much worse dynamic because traders within the gates of, of Europe who actually really hate Western civilization, they are allowing this invasion to happen because they think it will help to break the back of Western Judeo-Christian civilization. They don't realize, these socialists don't realize in the end like many others, they'll wind up Islamicized themselves. You know, for 1,400 years, 
Islam has defeated adjoining countries that were richer, stronger, smarter, and and basically mocked these, you know, cruel desert savages. But you come back a century later, and guess what? The cruel desert savages won. You know, when when the Mongols invaded the Crimea, they defeated militarily. They defeated the the um, Arabs, the, the Muslims that were there. You come back a century later, the Mongols are Islamic. So it's it's a very devious strategy appealing to the worst urges of men. Women have nothing to do with it. Sort of sort of um, promising men like a deal with the devil. You can have multiple wives. You can beat them, divorce them. You know you can rape women who aren't Muslims freely. It, it's a it's a horrible, to me, very satanic and diabolic cult, and it has spread successfully for 1,400 years. And something when I when I was researching this book, um, my counter jihad novel, I didn't realize that when the invasion of Spain happened, it wasn't the Spanish, or excuse me, it wasn't the like uh, desert Arabs that invaded Spain. It was the very strong, powerful Berbers of Morocco who had recently been Islamicized. So the scrawny desert Arabs that invaded across North Africa conquered Morocco, one valley, one mountain, one tribe at a time. And when they had the entire country, this this very strong, powerful, newly rejuvenated with that Berber blood, uh, that's who invaded Spain. And when the when the Turks would um, would uh, raid into the Balkans, they actually kidnapped children. It was like part of their tax to take the the strongest young men and and the prettiest young girls back to Turkey. They actually called them the Janissary Corps, and they were they were very smart, strong, you know. Uh, and and their best soldiers. Well, if Islam succeeds in completely putting Europe under Sharia, they're not going to be scrawny desert Arabs. They're going to be big, strong Swedes and Germans, but fully fanatically Islamic. So don't think that it's going to be you know something we don't have to worry about because the new the new Islamicized Europe they're going to be have they're going to have the rocket scientists and the you know, the ordnance engineers, they're not going to be weak, pitiful, puny little scrawny things. They're going to be powerful and strong and have the fanaticism of the convert. So that's my worry is not only, you know, that Europeans are going to lose their freedom, but an Islamic Europe is going to be a very dangerous powerhouse uh, in terms of its fanaticism and its and its new population. They're, they're going to be something to behold. And uh, I hate to sound depressing, but at least I'm not living there like Elizabeth. So I don't know um, what the future holds for your for your children, but it's very worrisome to me. Yes, Matt, uh, it worries me every single day. Uh, but don't think that I will that I will leave my country. Uh, I've I've been asked many many times, well, why don't you emigrate to the United States? Uh, you know, you could do so much good over here, and we'd love to have you. And and you know, it is you know, it's worth thinking about, uh, especially given that I do know the language and I do know the Constitution. So I guess the citizenship test wouldn't be too much of a challenge for me. Uh, but honestly. I love my country, and I will not leave my country to these people wanting to take over the country and wanting it for themselves. And uh, given that my husband is uh, is in the Austrian army, uh, there's absolutely no absolutely no possibility for us uh, to to leave Austria. And uh, you know, Katie Hopkins did a very good documentary about um, the uh, white. Uh, farmers in South Africa, and those farmers told her in the documentary that they also wouldn't leave their country and that they will start, they will die uh, standing in their boots, defending their land and their country. And that is exactly what I intend to do as well. But what can be done politically? Is there any chance of of electing? I know in Germany there's the um, AfD party. Is there anything no. like that in Austria? No, no. Is the, the uh, media also, is controlled? 
The media is totally controlled. Uh, there is no uh, quote unquote opposition media at all. Uh, the the opposition is completely uh, silenced. Uh, we have uh, no way of voicing our opinions now that the Austrian Freedom Party uh, is uh, basically it's disintegrated. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we even have no party to vote for. So we're, I'm not politically cur currently I'm not politically represented in Austria, and. Uh, you know what happens when uh, people are no no longer feel represented. They usually, uh, and we know that from history, you know, it usually leads to some sort of revolution or maybe even worse than that, but usually bloodshed. Uh, now, you, I certainly won't do that. But go ahead. What do you What do you feel or hear from the younger generation? Because if, if I was in my you know, teens or 20s and I was an Austrian you know, young man or young woman, I would be very terrified and, and I, I would um, probably be forming some kind of tribal or gang relationship just to be able no. to, you know, it's no, not happening. There's no, uh, no, no, uh, there's no resistance uh, of any sort uh, anywhere in Europe. I mean, you know what happened with the English Defense League, that it was uh, infiltrated and, and basically destroyed. And uh, there is no, th there's no opposition, neither political nor uh, coming directly from the people themselves. Uh, the Austrian youth are more concerned about uh, climate change and uh, skipping uh, school on Fridays to protest uh, uh, climate change than anything else. Uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you anything. I can't give you any better news than that, uh, because we we can't even have clandestine meetings anywhere. Uh, we we won't. There, there's nothing, honestly, and people don't believe me when I tell them that when I'm in the U.S. There is no opposition. People are giving in. Uh, people are well. Basically, you know what? It, it seems like the situation. Uh, it must have been like that in the 1930s. Aust the Austrian is very complacent. The Austrian doesn't really do anything uh, until it's too late. And uh, remember also that the Austrians were at the forefront of persecution uh, among the, the high-ranking Nazis uh, during uh, Hitler's regime here in Austria. Uh, and that's exactly what I fear is going to happen again. This is, this is just in our DNA, apparently. Wow, that's pretty depressing. But as long as yes. some people are staying to fight. So there's no Tommy Robinson. It's just Elizabeth Sabadich Wolf. That's it. And even she has been silenced, Matt. Even even I've been silenced. I no longer uh, do any sort of public speaking uh, anywhere in Europe. Uh, I've been silenced. I just, you know, I feel like I've done my share uh, here in Europe. I've done everything I could, and I think now it's time for others to take over. Well, if you can, folks watching this, you can buy her book on Amazon, and that's one way of supporting her. And um, you know, you can get my books too, great Christmas gifts. And if you if you um, get them straight from me from my post office, you don't have to give half the money to Jeff Bezos. And, uh, well, and I, I can, wish I, if, if I may step in, Matt, uh, if people get in touch with me, uh, I can direct them to my manager and they can also skip uh, Matt Bezos' uh, ha share in the book. <laughs>want to talk about perhaps getting into the more spiritual side of, of things and and we talk about um, this the energy and the, the spirit of, of things I'm a musician I'm an artist and so it's important for me to be to be clear-headed and to make sure that I'm, I'm able to tap into that unseen force that that higher power that that we're all can I've been preaching a lot about connectivity and the way that music affects us and as 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 we get closer to that spirit and I was saying how 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 the infowars products keeps my spirit clean it keeps my body healthy so that I can function at a higher level my body's able to my brain's able to Which function Which product you like the best? What's really 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 changed my life is the knockout but also the chill force with the gaba 
has changed my life. I'm one of these people, again, you know, I'm an artist, so, you know, I'm a little bit of a diva. I have problems with anxiety. I've experienced depression. And since I've been on, I've taken the Chill Force Challenge with Chill Force and Brain Force. The GABA has done amazing things for me with anxiety and, and keeping m me you know, me calm and, and, and not having me react the way that, you know, your brain reacts when uh, the neurotransmitters just which is fire. And, and, and if, again, you go and, and research the products and what they can. Well, that's can what we do is we go out of what's already proven to work. Then we just source organic and high quality forms of it, make sure there's a lot of it in there. Because, you know, I mean, take something like what happens with turmeric. Well, most of it has 3 to 5% of humanoid. We actually went out and got the highest anybody can make, 95% of humanoid. So the amount, it doesn't even say giant on there because you're not supposed to count it as a concentrate. You just say it has turmeric in it, but it's really the strongest turmeric you're going to find out there. And that's why the stuff works so good. And that's what I treat with folks like I want to be treated. I take all these products. My children take the products. That's how we fund the operation. But I appreciate the fact that you use them. Uh, and you like them, and absolutely do. Mother Nature is where the drug companies got all their stuff. They just twist right. it around. And that's all we're bringing you is what God gave us. And so they are amazing products. And I appreciate you saying those plugs for my friend. No worries. I mean it. I always hear people as well that call up and they want to know what they can do. They know what's going on. They understand the 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 problem that that we're that we're facing with with all of the the tyranny, the, the oppression. What can I do? Uh, I'm just a regular person. Everybody should be brushing their teeth. So, I mean, you can buy a, a, a toothpaste. Everybody drinks coffee in the morning. Buy buy coffee from in, from InfoWars. Well, 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 I appreciate you doing that. Into because here's the deal. operation. Well, we're able to pay the bills right now, but I want to expand and I want to really give them a run for their money in 2020 because I think you can see it's all on the line here.